it's not right, um, ethically, morally. An investigation into a local police department. I'm flabbergasted by all this. Uh, he was my police chief. A former police chief and multiple officers accused of ghost employment, allegedly working other jobs while they were on duty with the police department, leading to questions about public safety and the use of taxpayer dollars. Do you think that's significant? I think it's very significant, yeah, and, and, uh, and alarming. WRTV Investigates has been digging into this story for more than a year, what we're uncovering, and what you have to know. The News at 6 starts right now. And first tonight, a new criminal investigation and state audit are underway to allegations of ghost employment within the Columbus Police Department. We're talking about police officers accused of working other jobs while on the clock for the department. WRTV investigates Kara Kenny has learned that even the top officers in the department are under investigation. Columbus is a mid-sized city with about 50,000 residents. Dave Jones is one of them, and he's concerned about his family's safety. Breaking and entering and drugs and theft and on the streets. Um, over the years, it's gotten worse. Dave expects police to focus on crime and public safety, but Dave has concerns after we shared our findings of Columbus police officers moonlighting. Did you know your taxpayer money was being spent this way? Absolutely not. We'll get to those findings, but first, the backstory. Back in February, prosecutors criminally charged Columbus Police Lieutenant Dan Meister and Sergeant Ronald May after an investigation by Indiana State Police found they worked overlapping shifts at the police department and worked security at Columbus Regional Hospital on numerous occasions between 2015 and 2018. The charges? Theft, official misconduct, and ghost employment. IU Business Law and Ethics Professor Arthur Lopez explains why that's important. Ghost employment is basically stealing from the government, where you go out there and you are being paid, you have a pre-existing duty to do a job, but during that time, you're doing something else. You're doing some other job, so you're basically um, stealing. Police Chief John Rohde took office in May 2014, and in 2019, he had this to say about Meister and May. Our officers are held to the highest of standards and are expected to uphold and follow the law. But WRTV investigates received tips that Rohde and other officers were also working other jobs that overlap. We filed multiple records requests and found Rohde also worked security at Columbus Regional Hospital while he was chief, often relieved by Lieutenant Meister, one of the officers charged. We analyzed time records and counted at least 131 days between 2015 and 2018 in which Rody's work with the city appeared to overlap with his shift at Columbus Regional Hospital. While most police officers spend their days and nights going out on runs in the community, the role of a police chief is much more administrative in nature. Police administration office hours are 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., according to their website. But time records show Chief Rohde typically worked at the hospital from 3.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. one day a week. Rohde had a third job, too. While he was chief, John Rohde also worked as a mediator for the Indiana Office of Court Services. As an attorney, he helped resolve mortgage foreclosure cases between homeowners and banks. Records show Rohde billed the state for hundreds of phone and in-person conferences that all took place during normal business hours. We counted 68 days between May 2014 and 2018 in which Rohde reported working a full day at the police department but also worked for court services services, sometimes for hours. For example, on August 3rd, 2017, records show Rody was in court hearings for the state from 1.30 p.m., with the last one starting at 4.15 p.m. The same day, records show he also claimed to be working a full day during normal business hours at the Columbus Police Department. What do you think about that? It's appalling, really. It's not right. There's no way that he could have been giving 100% to any of his any of his duties anywhere he was at, especially not as police chief um, when he should have been on the clock. Rody would not speak with us about his two other jobs. Former Columbus Mayor Kristen Brown appointed John Rody as chief in May 2014. When you were the mayor, did you know that he was doing this? No, I had no idea. 
kind of makes you wonder, like, when did he have time to be the police chief? Brown says it's important for the chief to be there during normal business hours to respond to questions and concerns from officers, citizens, the mayor and city council. They expect the police chief to be there Monday through Friday, 8, eight to 5. Uh, that's, that's his job. Brown started looking into this more than a year ago. A friend of mine was going through a foreclosure and said, hey, you'll never guess who was my mediator uh, through this foreclosure process. It's the police chief. And I said, really? Brown says officers are not allowed to just shift their schedules around to accommodate a second job. She points to city policy that says all officers shall report to duty on or before the scheduled time and shall not be absent without leave. Records reflect that Rody occasionally used paid time off to accommodate his other jobs, but most of the time he did not. However, records also show Rody started using more paid time off on the days he worked other jobs at the end of 2018 when the Meister and May investigations began. Why should taxpayers know that this was going on? At the end of the day, it's their hard earned money. But yeah, they should care. It's their money. Records show that as police chief, Rody earned more than $80,000 a year. His extra work at the hospital and court services brought in an additional $100,000 over a span of six years. He can't be paid by the city uh, while he's working for someone else. I mean, that's ghost employment. We also shared our findings with Professor Lopez. He's a former police officer and says law enforcement is held to a higher standard. He is a role model. The rest of his people are watching. So do we know that the rest of his force is saying, well, the boss is doing it. Why can't I do it? Kristen Brown says other officers did the same thing. No, it doesn't appear to be isolated. It, 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 it appears to be pervasive. Time records she obtained show two other officers also worked at the hospital and had overlapping hours with their police shifts. We tried to get those same records, but the city told us it does not have records responsive to our request. WRTV Investigates has confirmed a criminal investigation is underway. Indiana State Police telling us they're investigating allegations of ghost employment involving the Columbus Police Department. Special prosecutors have also been appointed and WRTV has learned the Indiana State Board of Accounts is conducting an audit into the allegations as well. John Rohde stepped down as chief at the end of 2019 and is now a captain with the department. He was elected a superior court judge in Bartholomew County and heads to the bench in January. Michael Richardson is now the police chief. Records show state auditors are also reviewing Richardson's time records as well. We requested on-camera interviews with the mayor, the current police chief, as well as Captain John Rohde. All three declined, as well as the city attorney, who sent us this statement saying he understands that the city's timekeeping system can be confusing. The city attorney points out they implemented a new digital timekeeping system in January 2019 that added additional checks and balances. His statement went on to say the police department operates 24 hours a day and the officers from the newest patrol officer to the chief of police are required to be present at meetings, training and emergencies that might arise outside of their regular working hours. Traditional work schedules aren't always applicable and our goal is to respond to the needs of the community. Brown agrees the chief sometimes has to work outside of business hours for things like city council and neighborhood watch meetings. Each of those times, he's earning paid time off. But Brown points out Rody often was not using paid time off when working for the hospital and court services. Legally, he's perfectly uh, legally able to do that again, as long as he's taking paid time off from the city, which he clearly wasn't doing. Brown and taxpayer Dave Jones say the city needs to make additional changes. If you're gonna have a job outside of the city, it probably should be disclosed. I think that would go a long way. Additional policies and procedures should be put in place. It needs to be locked down. Um, you need to be on the job. Working for you, Kara Kenny, WRTV.
Officers Meister and May are now retired from the department. They have repaid taxpayers more than $9,000. That's what state auditors requested they pay back. Both Meister and May are scheduled for a court hearing on December 23rd, during which they're expected to plead guilty to at least one of the charges. Their attorneys have not responded to our requests for comment. You can read the full statement from the Columbus City Attorney in this story on the WRTV app and at our website at WRTV.com. This evening, more local frontline health care workers are getting Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. Just after 5 p.m., Ascension St. Vincent Hospital started vaccinating several of their employees. This comes a day after IU Health vaccinated some of its own health care workers. And developing tonight, a United States expert advisory panel is backing Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine. The next step is an FDA vote to determine whether Moderna's vaccine will get emergency approval like Pfizer's. The FDA usually follows the recommendations of that advisory panel. An FDA vote can come at any time. As the vaccine begins to roll out to healthcare workers this week, IU Health already began vaccinating their staff yesterday. And Ascension St. Vincent is beginning today as we speak. We wanted to answer some of the most pressing questions you might have about the vaccine. WRTV Stephanie Wade is working to answer your questions tonight. As the vaccine is rolled out to frontline workers, people in the general public are starting to think about whether they will want to get the vaccine or not once it becomes more widely available and have many questions surrounding the vaccination process. As any new vaccine, right, there are still going to be some unknowns in terms of how long that immunity lasts. There are still many questions waiting to be answered about this new COVID-19 vaccine. What are the side effects of this vaccine? I think people are worried uh, about side effects. You're debating, should I or shouldn't I, right? Um, think about your risk factor. So if you are high risk, if you are over um, the age 65 or 75, right, do you have other comorbidities? Do you have heart disease? Do you have respiratory conditions? Are you overweight or obese? People with any of these pre-existing conditions, health experts say should be at the highest priority for receiving the vaccine. Both IU Health Infectious Disease Specialist and U Indy Assistant Professor of Public Health agree you might have some side effects like any other vaccine. You start getting those fevers, fatigue, headaches, muscle aches, and it looks like you have the virus. But those will resolve within a day or two. I just want people to know that even if you get them with the first dose, please take your second despite those side effects. With both the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, should Moderna get approved, you will need to get two doses for it to be effective. Otherwise, you won't be considered protected from the virus. Pfizer requires a three week period in between doses. Moderna requires four. Should I prefer one manufacturer's vaccine over the other? I think uh, I can tell you that they all went through the same vetting process, right? There are more differences in how they're stored and what temperatures they're stored at, but from a medical perspective, they are very, very similar. Some people also worry of an allergic reaction to the virus in some reported cases. The two that had it in Britain had uh, already were prone to get severe uh, allergies where they had to carry an EpiPen around. So this is not your typical, I have an allergy to penicillin or I have an allergy to food. They expect doctors Doctors will alert patients once they have the vaccine to schedule their appointment. Which vaccine people receive, however, will likely come down to access. It's also unclear how long the virus might protect you. I think that's a question that is a magic ball question. We don't know. We have seen that there are two, there's at least two different strains of COVID that are out there, that it has mutated. Is it something that will continue to mutate? Stephanie Wade, WRTV. At this time, the vaccine is not approved for people younger than 16 years old. They have only been monitoring the clinical trial for a few months, so it's still unclear about any long-term effects. To reach herd immunity, experts say we need 60 to 70 percent of people to be vaccinated to stop the spread of the coronavirus. The IPS superintendent says she will take the vaccine and encourage others to do so when it becomes available to educators. Alicia Johnson also says IPS is in no rush to return to in-person classes after the Christmas break. The Marion County Health Department says it's OK to have classes in school on January 4th. Johnson says the earliest students will be back in the classroom, if at all, is January 19th. We still want to do our due diligence to be sure that when we return to school, we're doing so under um, safer conditions. So I don't anticipate a return before the 19th. 
Johnson wants families to follow appropriate health guidelines to avoid a spike in COVID cases after the Christmas break. The blue shows snow showers and flurries still ongoing. We'll talk about when that leaves and get ready for a wild temperature ride. Many people are struggling financially this holiday season and some will try to get a loan for help. But the warning you need to see before you do that in our 12 scams of Christmas. Welcome back. Many people are struggling financially this holiday season, especially because of the pandemic. So some are looking for help in the form of a loan, but you have to be extremely careful. Mallory Safostai with our Scripps Partners in Baltimore tells us about advance fee and emergency loans on day eight of the 12 scams of Christmas. Con artists are preying on desperate and vulnerable people. They set up sites advertising quick and instant loans, then make up reasons for why applicants need to send money first. For Jessica Murphy, this year has been hard for many reasons. I had cervical cancer and I had to have surgery and for months I was not making any money. She fell behind on her bills. Her credit score dropped, so she took the advice of her friends and sought out a loan company. I filled out a form of mine, um, just, you know, basic information like my name and my email and phone number, and they called me. A guy named Mike said she'd been approved, but she first needed to send money for insurance. I tried to explain to this man, like, I have no money. Like, I'm the only, all the money that I have is what I'm sending you so that I can get a bigger loan to pay my bills because I'm about to have surgery. I'm a single mother of two. Mike assured her as soon as he got the money, she'd receive a $3,000 loan. He asked me yet again for a third um, payment. And that's when I was like, absolutely not. I was like, not only did I already send you all the money that I have to my name, but you know, I know you're just, you're this is a scam. In all, she lost $700. And were you able to get any of it back? No, not a dime. We've definitely seen an uptick of these. Angie Barnett with the Better Business Bureau said it is illegal for any company to promise a loan and require payment before delivering. They do it under the name of COVID. They tell you you are now eligible. And all you have to do is provide money for processing fees, money for attorneys. And people are actually sending their last few dollars to these scams. Scams that are strategically designed to bait people who need money the most. 